Hello, uh, welcome to the uh, next, the 12th of my arbitration bootcamp sessions. I can't believe uh, we're at number 12. Today, I'm gonna talk about the aroma case and the duty to disclose, and in particular, has it changed the duty to disclose for arbitrators? Uh, just to remind you, this is a session that has been approved by the Law Society of Ontario for one hour of professionalism credits. And uh, as I say, this is the 12th in my series. I'm not going to do a, a session in December, although I normally do these monthly because I think we all need a break in December. So I'll see you again in January after this session. Thanks to the, those of you who have sent me emails with topics that you'd like to cover, you'd like me to cover, and I will be pleased uh, to get ideas for 2024 if there are topics or cases or, or uh, issues that you'd like me to cover in an arbitration bootcamp session. All these sessions are recorded and they're available on YouTube afterwards. And the usual uh, format is I'll talk for about 45 minutes. I'll leave 15 minutes for questions. Please put them in the Q&A box. If I see them pop up while I'm talking, I will try to answer them at that time. But if I just can't, I don't see it or I can't do it, I'll, I will uh, address those questions at the end. And I'll leave some time also for questions uh, to pop in after I say uh, uh, my initial thoughts about the uh, the case. Just to remind you, if you haven't tuned in or if you haven't tuned in, uh, I am a partner at Learners, an arbitration, uh, arbitrator at Arbitration Place. And I have a blog uh, that is called Arbitration Matters, where I post summaries of cases and some analysis of those cases as cases are released across Canada. It's at www.arbitrationmatters.com. You can take a look at the, at the blog. There's over 900 case summaries now, or you can subscribe for free and get uh, about eight cases a month, one uh, for every second week. Uh, and that'll keep you up to date on arbitration case law around the country. So today, the, the question that, that got me interested in this topic in which uh, I'll share with you my thoughts on is whether the Aroma case has actually uh, made a difference and changed the duty to disclose because it's a case that's had a fair amount of buzz, which is, I assume, uh, one of the reasons that, that you're here. And I think the short answer is, I, I'm not sure that it's really changed uh, the arbitrator's duty to disclose. And I'll talk about some of the problems, I think, with the, with the court's analysis, but it has changed the practice of many of the arbitrators I've spoken to. And so I think for that reason, it's an important case. It also just reminds us of the significance of uh, the duty to disclose and the consequences uh, if there's a motion to disqualify an arbitrator and to remind arbitrators and counsel of the various resources that are available in order to help make critical decisions about whether there is a potential conflict of interest. So uh, just to give you the citation for the case, if you don't have it, Aroma Franchise Company, Inc. et al. against Aroma Espresso Bar Canada, Inc. et al. 2023, Ontario Supreme Court, 1827. And it is going to be heard by the Ontario Court of Appeal on December the 6th. So we should have an answer to many of the questions that I have about uh, the significance of this case once we have uh, that decision. The Aroma case is an international arbitration seated in Ontario. And the case involves a motion to set aside two awards on the basis of the arbitrator's failure to meet his duty to disclose. And uh, the, there, the court concluded there was a reasonable apprehension of bias on the part of the arbitrator. This was a multiple appointments case, and that is a very fraught area. The court articulated the issue as, this is a case about whether the arbitrator ought to have disclosed a subsequent retainer from the same lawyer while the Aroma case was ongoing, and whether in the circumstances of this case, his failure to do so would give rise to a reasonable apprehension of bias. And as I say, the court found both a breach of the duty to disclose and a reasonable apprehension of bias on the part of the arbitrator. And just as a reminder, that was not a finding that the arbitrator was biased, but that there was a reasonable apprehension of bias. And, and in fact, this result is consistent with what I and others have noticed in the case law generally, and that is there as a broadening expectation uh, that arbitrators will disclose uh, circumstances which even a few years ago may not have been considered disclosable. And this is particularly influenced by international arbitration on domestic practice. 
So why is this case so important and why are people talking about it? Again, this is the first significant multiple appointments case, and it's an issue that arises fairly frequently. This was an arbitration under the model law as adopted in Ontario under the uh, International Commercial Arbitration Act. And so to the extent that it's a model law uh, case, it does have consequences across, across the country. But notwithstanding that this was a model law case, the court talked uh, about the issues from the perspective of the reasonable apprehension of bias test, which is in fact a domestic act standard and test. It's not the model law standard. And so that I think is significant and I'll tell you why in a few moments, but ultimately uh, my view is that the result of the case likely would not have been different had the uh, model law test been used. The case is also, I think, important because many of us were surprised when we saw the outcome. When the um, UK Halliburton Company case, and I'll give you that, that citation in a, moment, in a moment, came out in 2020, it was a multiple appointments case. And I think a lot of us view that as kind of the watermark, the indication of where we would see duties to disclose and where we would see potential uh, risk of disqualification of arbitrators. And in fact, that case might very well have led this arbitrator and, and many of us who saw the, uh, were reading the case to think that this certainly wouldn't have resulted in disqualification. I'll explain that towards the end of my remarks. The citation for the Halliburton case is Halliburton Company against Chubb Bermuda Insurance. 2020 UKSC 48. So let's go back to the aroma case and set the stage with the background facts because of course the, the factual background and the circumstances of every case are absolutely essential because obviously the facts change and the potential outcome changes. So these cases are all fact specific which is why it becomes quite diff difficult uh, to figure out general trends. So the, the, in my view, reasonable persons as a result of that could have come to a different conclusion. So both on the arbitrator side and on the court side. So the, the, uh, the arbitration, which I'm going to call the aroma, aroma arbitration, was a franchise dispute. And the claimant was the master franchi franchisee of the respondent franchisor. And there were claims and counterclaims uh, between the parties on whether there, there was a termination of the agreement. And the sole arbitrator was appointed jointly by these parties. So the actual issues in the litigation are less important than the, than the, the disqualification uh, set aside issue. So the disclosure issue, first of all, approximately 17 months into the Aroma arbitration, the arbitrator was appointed by counsel for the franchisee in the Aroma arbitration by the same counsel in another unrelated arbitration without disclosing this new appointment to the franchisor. Or, I, I believe the court says, the other party to the uh, Aroma arbitration, the other party to the Aroma arbitration, or the other party to the unrelated arbitration. So how did the franchisor discuss, dis discover uh, this, this issue? The council found out after the hearing had been closed, which is why the, the, the relief being sought here is not disqualification of the arbitrator, but rather a set aside of the award. The arbitrator advised counsel that the final award in the arbitrator, Ar Aroma arbitration was completed and requested a further deposit. The email was mistakenly sent to counsel at the same firm for the franchisee that was involved in the other unrelated arbitration and did not include every counsel at that same firm who was on the Aroma arbitration. Then when the award was circulated to the parties, the arbitrator sent that email to the same individuals. The, when the counsel for the franchisor saw the recipient list, he had some questions and he asked why those counsel had been copied with the email sending out the final award. And the arbitrator responded that he had been appointed in an unrelated matter, which was not a franchise dispute. It was in an unrelated business or in entity and there was no connection between the parties. The franchisor then moved 
to set aside the award under section 34 sub 2 sub a little 4 of the model law which has as a ground composition of the arbitral tribunal or the procedure was not in accordance with the agreement of the parties so essentially the argument was that the 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 uh, arbitrator wasn't appointed in accordance with the party's agreement. The court ultimately set aside the awards and found that the arbitrator had failed in his duty of disclosure and he was uh, there was a reasonable apprehension of bias. So let's look at the factual background and the circumstances that are, are relevant to this determination. The most important of them is the arbitration clause. In the franchise, franchise agreement, which said specifically, the parties shall jointly select one neutral arbitrator from the panel of arbitrators maintained by the ADR Institute of Canada. The arbitrator must either be a retired judge, a lawyer experienced in the practice of arbitration law and in, in franchise law, that's important, or and who has no prior social, business, or professional relationship with either party. And it's those words in particular that are relevant to this case. No prior social, business, or professional relationship with either party. The arbitrator saw the arbitration clause before appointment. And it's important to note that the arbitration agreement does not prohibit an arbitrator from accepting another arbitration appoint, uh, appointment where the arbitrator has some business relationship with counsel. So the arbitration agreement speaks only to a professional or biz relation, business relationship with the party. And of course, the second uh, unrelated arbitration involved uh, the same counsel, but not the same parties. However, the court referred in the Aroma case to a lengthy uh, exchange of correspondence between counsel for the parties in the Aroma arbitration, in which counsel had previously objected to any arbitrator with a business relationship with counsel of the firm or either party. And that included ongoing engagements. And at the end of the day, uh, they chose this arbitrator in part because he had been never engaged as a mediator or arbitrator by either counsel previously. Now, the wrinkle here is that this exchange of correspondence was not actually known to the arbitrator. So the arbitrator didn't appreciate that a relationship with counsel was a significant factor for the parties in choosing him as an arbitrator. The evidence of the franchisor, of course, was that had the arbitrator made disclosure of this fact, uh, it would not, he would not have been selected as the arbitrator. And the court said that while this is hindsight evidence, it was actually supported by the correspondence that I've just referred to. And so there was um, a reason to accept the evidence that had um, the arbitrator had a previous relationship with counsel, he would not have been agreed to by both parties. The other thing the court found which was important was that the other arbitration was not a franchise dispute. <coughs> And although there were overlapping causes of action, there were it was not relevant to the analysis. The facts were, were different. Another thing that the court found was an important factor was the fact that the arbitrator was a sole arbitrator. This was a factor. And, what, and the franchisor argued that this was important because the arbitrator had control over the outcome. So... Just to remind everyone on the phone call about the, the foundation for these issues. The general principles are that an arbitrator has an ethical duty to be both independent and impartial. And if the arbitrator concludes that he or she is not able to do that, they must decline the appointment or resign if a conflict exists. And that resignation must occur regardless of where in the arbitration the, uh, the, the proceedings are. The duty to disclose refers to circumstances that may undermine the independence or impartiality of the arbitrator. And as we'll see as we go further, whether this is a subjective or, an, or objective test depends on the legislation that, that's applicable. However, the disqualification test uh, is generally objective. And essentially, there, the arbitrator is disqualified if there is a real or apprehend, a, apparent loss of independence or, arbit or, or impartiality. The court also set out the following principles, which I think are not controversial. The threshold for disqualification is high, 
the presumption of impartiality is high, the inquiry is objective and requires a practical review of all of the circumstances from the perspective of a reasonable person, and there must be evidence beyond mere suspicion that an arbitrator would not bring an impartial mind to bear. Context matters in all of these determinations. The, the first point that I think is significant and that I think um, it, it, that that overlays all of my comments about the case are that first, the court applied the wrong, the wrong test. The court referred to the reasonable apprehension of bias test, which is language from the uh, uh, Ontario Act. Although the court correctly recognized that this was a model law case and it was an international arbitration and in fact cited the relevant provisions of the model law. So if we go to the model law and we look at the requirement for a challenge to be successful, Article 12.1 provides an obligation on the part of the arbitrator to disclose any circumstances likely to give justifiable doubts as to his impartiality or independence at the time of the appointment and throughout the proceedings. And I've referred here to the IBA conflicts uh, guidelines on conflicts of interest in international law because they are generally accepted as uh, helpful in determining whether conflicts of interest uh, arise and when arbitrators are required to make disclosure of potential conflicts in international cases, which are not always model law cases, but certainly this, this, um, these guidelines are directed at model law cases. And what they say are that if there are facts or circumstances that may in the eyes of the parties give rise to doubts as to the arbitrator's impartiality or independence, the arbitrator shall disclose such facts or circumstances prior to accepting the appointment or as soon thereafter as the arbitrator learns of them. And this is considered to be a subjective test because the, the assessment is from the perspective of the eyes of the parties as opposed to a reasonable person. And you may say to yourself, how can an arbitrator possibly put himself or herself in the position of the parties in order to make that determination. And that's where the IBA guidelines um, come in handy. There are, the, the IBA guidelines use a traffic light system in which there is a red list of facts and circumstances in which the, there is a clear conflict of interest. The arbitrator must make disclosure. And in fact, uh, there's a waivable red list and a non-waivable red list, which means there are some circumstances in which the conflict is so clear that parties should not be allowed to waive them. Uh, as others, they can. The orange list, which is relevant to this case, are circumstances in which the, the relationship must be disclosed because it may give rise to a reasonable doubt in the eyes of the parties, but it, it's not considered to be an exhaustive list. So there's lots of room for interpretation by courts and by arbitrators on when the duty of care arises. And this case was an orange list case. The, the green list is one in which there is no basis for a finding of a conflict of interest and there is no duty to, to disclose. So the court in, in Aroma did consider that the IBA guidelines were, were very useful in drawing a conclusion in this case. So if we now go to the disqualification test, and this is under Article 12.2, an arbitrator may be challenged only if circumstances exist that give rise to justifiable doubts as to his impartiality or independence. And again, the IBA guidelines on conflict of interest provide some help. Doubts are justifiable if a reasonable third person having knowledge of the relevant facts and circumstances would reach the conclusion that there's a likelihood that the arbitrator may be influenced by factors other than the merits of the case. So this is an objective test. And so this is the same test that applies whether an arbitrator is considering refusing or declining an appointment or resigning from an appointment. And so you've got a much broader subjective test for disclosure and a narrower objective test for disqualification under the model law. The guidelines also deal with multiple appointment situations, which, which are clearly relevant to the aroma case. So I'll give you an example. Where an arbitrator has within the past three years 
been appointed on more than three occasions by the same council or the same law firm. Three years, three occasions, same council or law firm. That is a disclosable situation. It's not this case. Another example where the arbitrator has within the past three years been appointed as an arbitrator on two or more occasions by one of the parties or affiliate. So three years, two or more occasions by a party. And these the, the rules are there for making a distinction between the number of times a council uh, may appoint an arbitrator and parties may appoint an arbitrator. And that may be a, a reflection that council are more often involved in the, the whole uh, arbitration process than parties. Notwithstanding that, um, this is not this case either. This 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 uh, arbitrator was not appointed on two or more occasions by the parties. So an arbitrator looking at this situation could very well say, well, this there is no duty that arises specifically uh, under the guidelines on these facts. However, there's some that there's some uh, discussion in the in the guideline that is, that 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 is in the introduction to the guidelines, but doesn't enumerate the various situations in which du duty to disclose arises. And what it says is that an appointment made by the same party or the same council appearing before an arbitrator while the case is ongoing may also have to be dis disclosed depending on the circumstances. So this is this case. So the court looking at the case and the arbitrator looking at the case sees there is no positive du duty to disclose. It all depends on the circumstances. And so you can see that the findings of fact by the court here are absolutely critical. And the the facts as known to the arbitrator are absolutely critical. Here, the court found that the circumstances required uh, disclosure. And I say conflated the duty of disclosure and the disqualification test. Although, as I say, I don't think it had any impact on the outcome of the case. So again, the court looked at the domestic te test, which was the reasonable apprehension of bias test, which is an objective test that we see in, in a, the Supreme Court of Canada case of Committee for Justice and Liberty Against National Energy Board, 1978-1 SCR 369, and essentially whether an informed person would reasonably, would reasonably come to the conclusion that they're, they're um, that there is more likely than not that the decision maker, whether consciously or unconsciously, would not decide fairly. And this is the objective quest, uh, test for disqualification under the domestic reasonable apprehension of bias test. In this case, however, the court looked strictly at the reasonable apprehension of bias test and went straight to the issue of disqualification without really considering the issue of the duty to disclose and whether those two tests should or were any different. And the facts the, the facts the court relied upon were the following. Arbitrators, unlike judges, have a financial interest in getting an appointed. And based on the decisions, there was no evidence before the court on what, if any, financial interest uh, was understood by the parties, disclosed, whether there was any evidence at all before the court on that. The fact that the arbitrator has accepted this engagement is not itself sufficient to give rise to a reasonable apprehension of bias. That's what the court said. But there was no discussion in the no evidence before the court about how the arbitrator was appointed in the second unrelated arbitration. Who suggested the arbitrator be engaged? Did the other counsel know that the arbitrator had already been and was currently an arbitrator in the aroma arbitration? And the court says, without explicitly giving criticism to anybody, says, this speaks volumes. The arbitrator had never before been retained in a matter involving those counsel. And in this matter, was re was retained in a second unrelated matter while the arbitration, the aroma arbitration was ongoing. The court also referred to the fact that it was very clear that in the pre-appointment letters, the parties did not want to appoint somebody with a relationship with counsel. And the court concluded that a fair-minded person would conclude that the circumstances gave rise to a reasonable apprehension of bias. So my first comment is the court applied the wrong test. My second 
point is that the application of the wrong test likely did not affect the result because the application of the disqualifying the disqualification test was an objective test, which is exactly what is called for in the uh, in the model law. And although the language of the objective test and the domestic test and the model law test are different, I have not seen a case which suggests that the, that the effect of those tests is, is any different. It's essentially a, an objective test. And ultimately, the cases, the, the cases are all fact driven. So if you were to apply, I say, the model law objective test to the specific facts that the judge relied upon, I say you get to the same result. Query whether you get to the same result if, for example, the court had not taken into account facts that the arbitrator wasn't aware of. The, the third point that I think that I think is not important, but is a flag that is interesting to raise is that the court's analysis raises the potential for conflicting duties. And the court talked talked about the ADRIC rules and the ADRIC code of ethics, which use slightly different language. And she gave no interpretation to that language. But the point that I think is important is that particularly in a in international arbitration, there may be different obligations on the part of counsel. Uh, for example, we have our uh, rules of professional conduct in which there are specific uh, obligations about avoiding conflicts of interest. And so there may be an issue. And again, this will arise in in uh, an international case where the, the council's obligations and perhaps the arbitrator's obligations, if the arbitrator is, is a lawyer, are not necessarily consistent with what the model law requires. How does that um, that jungle get navigated? Again, it doesn't apply in this case, but it comes up and it's uh, something I thought was an interest, uh, interesting point to raise. Fourth, the IBA guidelines will not always lead to consistent results. The IBA guidelines are guidelines. The list of relationships and facts that are in the guidelines and in the orange list are explicitly non-exhaustive. And as you've seen from the, the few provisions that I've cited, I would argue it was possible for both the court and the arbitrator to come to a, a different different conclusions. So each arbitrator all ultimately must use uh, his or her own judgment with no real um, assurance in many cases that, that that the decision that's made is is the correct one. And so there's an inevit inevitable risk that both counsel and parties and the arbitrator make about the possibility that their the the duty to disclosure is not clear in in this particular situation and the issue may then arise after the the uh, the award has been uh, issued and and the parties have put been put to the time and expense of an arbitration as as was the case in this situation. Now, interestingly enough, the 2020 uh, BC Act now makes the test for disqualification much more stringent, and I think it's an interesting development and one that uh, I'll see if if it it catches. Arbitrator may be challenged only if there is a real danger of bias. And I've spoken to somebody who was involved in the drafting of the new legislation who says that the drafting uh, people had in mind specifically the number of challenges uh, to the impartiality and independence of an arbitrator, which that committee viewed as frivolous. Efforts by the the uh, losing party to either set aside an award or by a reluctant uh, party to slow the arbitration. So there are ambiguities in the guidelines about when disclosure should be made and when an uh, 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 arbitrator may be disqualified for bias. Fifth, some of the facts and circumstances the court relied upon are problematic. So I've already said a couple of times that the fact that the 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 pre-appointment communications between the our, uh, council about which the arbitrator knew nothing, in my submission, is, is, is problematic to the court's analysis. But the, the court also said that the fact that the arbitrator was a sole arbitrator was a factor. And the interesting thing is that the IBA guidelines specifically say that the, whether the arbitrator is a member of a panel or a sole arbitrator makes no difference. And because the court was, was has had accepted the application of the IBA guidelines, it would have been interesting to see uh, that analysis, but the court actually didn't refer to that provision in the IBA guidelines. The court also sat, found that there was a financial incentive for the arbitrator to take on multiple appointments 
which can raise doubts about impartiality. There, this was not based on, on evidence. The court did not consider one party's submission that there are only a handful of arbitrators who have franchise experience. In other words, the pool of arbitrators is, is limited and whether that should affect the disqualification test. And I say, yes. Uh, in fact, that was an issue considered by the court in the Halliburton case. So you can imagine that if in franchise law, there are known to be a handful of arbitrators who do this work. And so it should be expected by counsel and the parties that those arbitrators will appeal will appear frequently in those kinds of arbitrator, arbitrations. So the test may be different, and that's another example of context matters. The court heard evidence about the circumstances of the new engagement and said, and this is a quotation, there is a lot left unsaid, and that it was a bad look that the arbitrator was retained when he had never been retained by either council before. So there is a lot of commentary by the court, which is 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 critical. Um, the certain facts being left unsaid, which, which suggest my interpretation, and you should take a look at it and see if you agree with me, is that the, generally the court was uncomfortable about the situation and perhaps even suspicious and didn't always articulate exactly why, but certainly um, that led to the led to the outcome. Six, uh, so I'm now on my sixth topic that I think is interesting about this case. The court didn't address the parties duties of disclosure as opposed to the arbitrators and under the IBA guidelines and under under much of the jurisprudence and, and uh, relevant rules, et cetera, et cetera, the parties themselves have duties to disclose. And that's important because there could be issues, of course, that parties are, are, or counsel are aware of that the, the arbitrator is not aware of that could give rise to potential reasonable apprehension of bias. And so in this case, the counsel who had appointed the arbitrator on a second uh, on the second arbitration did not disclose that. And it only came to light, of course, when the arbitrator circulated the final award. The court doesn't talk about that. Although maybe some of the comments about uh, that I've suggested made her uncomfortable, um, suggest that, that this was perhaps a concern, but never explicitly raised. And the question then arises uh, about what, what is the what is the significance of that? Um, the court didn't, for example, didn't consider whether the party's exchange of correspondence was an amendment to the arbitration agreement or where the, whether the later appointment of the arbitrator in the new arbitration constituted a breach of the current arbitration agreement. That's an interesting area of analysis. Ultimately, I think the outcome probably would have been the same because it would have been a request to set aside. Uh, the, the awards. So notwithstanding all of these issues, I think you're hearing from me that I think the outcome of the case likely would have been the same. But I do want to touch upon the Halliburton case um, because it was before Aroma, uh, the leading case on disqualification, certainly in the UK where there were multiple appointments. And the reason I say before Aroma is because it was considered to be very influential in Canada. And so before Aroma, Parties and counsel and courts looked to the Halliburton case in situations of multiple appointments to de make determinations about whether there was a duty to disclose or a duty uh, or a potential disqualification risk. And this was a situation in which the concern is far greater because there was a duty to disclosure where the arbitrator had received multiple appointments by the same party in different arbitrations involving the same subject matter and overlapping issues. So you can see already that the relationship among the various arbitration um, issues was, was, was closer. The, there were three insurance arbitrations which uh, involved one event, an oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, and Chubb was the insurer. And the case arose in uh, in the, the Halliburton and Chubb case. There was a there was a there was an issue about the denial of coverage by Chubb, and there was an ad hoc arbitration which took place uh, with the seat in London, and the arbitrator was appointed by the court as the chair of the tribunal. Chubb wanted uh, the arbitrator, but. Halliburton didn't, and this took place in June of 2015. And it is significant that the arbitrator was appointed by the court. The arbitrator before appointment made disclosure of his current involvement in two pending arbitrations with Chubb 
in which he had acted as arbitrator where Chubb had appointed him either as sole arbitrator or its party appointed arbitrator. Halliburton uh, did not in fact object as a result of that disclosure. Then there were two appointments made that in which the arbitrator was involved in related arbitrations that were not disclosed to Halbert. So the second was uh, in involving a, a denial over coverage in respect to the same loss. And Chubb appointed the same arbitrator in December of 2015. And then there was another appointment of the same arbitrator in August 2016, not involving Chubb, but an, an insurer, same subject matter. Halliburton discovered this issue in November 2016 and challenged the arbitrator who did not feel that he could resign because he had been appointed by the court. So the issue actually had to be determined, the disqualification issue had to be determined by the court. And essentially, the arbitrator did not disclose uh, to the um, parties involved in arbitration one, the fact that he was subsequently retained in arbitrations two and three on related matters. So the court, the, the party, uh, Halliburton, applied to have the arbitrator disqualified using the reasonable, reason, using the justifiable doubts as to his impartiality test. And just as a re reminder, the, the UK is not a domestic uh, is not a uh, model law jurisdiction, but you'll see that the analysis is actually very si similar. So the court ultimately found that the arbitrator breached his duty to disclose because he failed to disclose circumstances that might reasonably give rise to the appearance of bias. And Halliburton said, well, this test may be interpreted differently depending upon the type of arbitration. So, so the court said, for example, marine arbitrations are highly specialized and the same players are involved in the arbitrations time after time. So using the reasonable apprehension of bias test in that case may be uh, different than in this kind of a case. The court, however, found that the, the disqualification or removal test was not met. And this is important because the, the duty of care test, the duty of disclosure test, and the disqualification test are different. And even if there is a duty of failure to disclose, that does not necessarily mean that the arbitrator will be, will be uh, disqualified. Here, the court used an objective test, whether a fair-minded and informed observer would, having regard to the particular circumstances of, of international arbitration, which is an interesting addition, conclude that there was a real possibility that the arbitrator was biased and, and called that apparent bias. And it's fundamentally the same test as the justifiable te te test, I say in the IBA guidelines. So here's why the disqualification test was not met even though the arbitrator had a duty to disclose, and even though the arbitrator was involved in multiple arbitrations with overlapping issues at the same time. First of all, there was a lack of clarity about when there was a duty to disclose. There was no clear legislative requirement, and there was an implied duty, the court found, from the duty of independence and or impartiality, but not clearly on these facts. So there was no established custom in these circumstances with respect to multiple mandates. So no clear duty to disclose meant no duty to disclose, sorry, meant, meant duty to disclose, but there was no clear bias necessarily because the disqualification test, um, although it was clear, it wasn't clear when the duty to disclose arose. I know that sounds, I'm not sure I articulated that very well, but lack of clarity essentially on the obligation, obligation of the arbitrator uh, was problematic. The court also found it was unlikely that there was an overlap in legal or evidentiary issues and no suge suggestion that the arbitrator was deriving a secret financial benefit. And I think that's probably where the court in Aroma came up with this part of the analysis that in, it involved a consideration of whether the arbitrator was deriving some income from the second uh, arbitration, which would influence his decision on whether to take it or not. And there was also nothing to suggest that the arbitrator had subconscious ill will towards Halliburton in light of its efforts to remove him. So the franchisor in Aroma said that Halliburton should be distinguished because there was no statutory obligation to disclose in the U.S., unlike in the model law. 
And there was a requirement in the UK law for disqualification that there be a substantial injustice resulting, not a requirement under the, the uh, model law. So how might that analysis have affected Aroma? Well, number one, the dis duty disclosure disclosure arguably is not clear because the circumstances are not listed specifically on the orange list. There are additional factors that could weigh in favor of no disqualification. The arbitration uh, arose out of clearly different events. There was no overlap whatsoever. And so the circumstances are, 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 are um, quite different from Halliburton. Also, the, the circumstances involving an arbitration where franchise law is at issue is analogous to the marine law situation that the court in Halliburton referred to. It, that may well affect what the duty to disclose or uh, the disqualification test. So what are some of the practical implications that arise from this for, for arbitrators? Number one, is disclosure always the answer to avoid this potential outcome? And I think it's important to remember that whenever um, arbitrators are considering making disclosure, they need to think about things like confidenti confidentiality obligations. So, so if disclosure requires um, a breach of a confidentiality obligation, then of course the arbitrator must not make that disclosure and must decline the appointment. Uh, another issue is the difficulty in showing whether the arbitrators are arbitrations are similar, overlapping or not, in light of both the, the, the arbitrator's confidentiality obligations and the fact that most terms of appointment uh, prohibit the arbitrator from being called as a witness. In this case, that information was readily available because the parties had previously started litigation before the matter was was uh, referred to arbitration. So there was a clear set of pleadings that set out the, uh, the issues in the arbitration. That's rare. But if we go back to the idea of disclosure um, being the solution, apart from confidentiality issues, you can think of a circumstance in which you are approached as an arbitrator uh, uh, by uh, a, a counsel for a potentially new matter. And you consider that if you make disclosure to the counsel or the party in the existing matter, is that going to undermine the client in the existing matter, um, their confidence in you that you're independent and, and impartial. In other words, can the very fact of requesting consent raise concerns? Uh, and, and I think that that's a real possibility, particularly when the existing arbitration is early and the uh, parties may not have confidence in the arbitrator yet. Or what if there have been a number of uh, interim procedural orders that the council are not happy, our parties are not happy with, and suddenly they say, aha, this is because uh, the arbitrator has a relationship with this same council or this same party. So, so I think by 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 characterizing this as a as a as a disclosure issue alone is is probably simplifying uh, the case. And and I guess finally on this decision, um, I've spent a lot of time dissecting and analyzing this case, and I, I admit that perhaps my analysis is overly complicated. And I think that what this case really tells you is that with you know, and without looking at the IBA guidelines or even the case law, where there is where the arbitrator has multiple mandates at the same time with the same counsel, the same parties or on the same issues, there's a duty to disclose. Full, full stop, and there may give rise to a duty of dis, uh, 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 disqualification risk. And I think that that's generally how uh, council uh, arbitrators are, are conducting themselves at the moment. Now, I do want to say something um, about the Vento case, which many of you may know about, just to add to the to the mystery. Um, the Ontario Superior Court just released a case a couple of years ago called Vento. And, and, and it, I think, reinforces the idea that these cases are very fact specific and often unpredictable. So in this case, this was a tribunal of three. In the course of the arbitration, the one of the arbitrators was offered a lucrative appointment, which involved being on a roster of arbitrators and, and guaranteed multiple appointment opportunities. And this was uh, this was obviously significant work that was offered to this arbitrator while the arbitrator was sitting on an arbitration in which this council uh, was involved. And 
the, the communications were of course made ex parte. So the other council didn't know that this was going on. It raises the risk of course of a potential financial uh, incentive for the uh, arbitrator to look favorably upon that uh, council's client. And the tone of the, that correspondence was quite friendly. They used, they used uh, first names. Um, and so all of those things raised a, a concern on the part of the other party when, when that party learned about it. This was not, this information was not disclosed uh, during the course of the arbitration and the other party learned about it afterwards. The award, however, was not set aside because the court looked at the uh, Article 34 of the model law, which, which even if there's a finding of uh, a, a procedural concern, there is a, always a discretion on the part of the court not to set aside the award. And the, the court here said, well, well, yes, we see that there's a reasonable apprehension of bias, but we don't think that there was any unfairness and the result was not affected. And the court relied significantly upon the fact that the the award ultimately was unanimous among the three member tribunal, which means that the arbitrator whose conduct was under scrutiny did not apparently have an influence which affected the outcome of, of the award. Uh, I think that case is a bit of a head scratcher um, and I'm wondering whether we're gonna see an appeal of that decision. But you can see, therefore, that there's a lot of variation in how courts are viewing the, these issues, certainly in Ontario, and a lot of uncertainty when arbitration council are, are when arbitration council are making their disclosure uh, um, decisions, and when arbitrators are doing the same. I don't see any questions in the. Q&A box. I will give you a few moments. We've got about 10 minutes before the end of the of the session. While we do that, um, my next uh, session will take place in January at the usual time, 12 to 1, uh, in uh, January the 18th. And it's going to be all about awards, uh, both writing them and challenging them. So I don't see any Q&A popping up. Um, so thanks very much. I hope that this case has been useful. It's probably made you a little unset unsettled about what your obligations are as counsel and an arbitrator. And I think we're hoping that the Court of Appeal is going to ha help with that. Have a great day. Oh, one cost and oh, thank you. Very exciting to see what's next. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye.